Well, hey everyone, welcome back to another Wildwood Speedkeeping Podcast. I hope you're having a great day, and today we have Chris Warner as our um, guest, and I appreciate you, Chris, joining us tonight. Mm-hmm. And before we get into some of the topics I have planned and questions, of course, I was wondering if you could give us a brief um, overview of who you are and kind of how you got started in the beekeeping, if you could. Okay, Grayson, well, thank you for inviting me onto your, your live chat. <clears throat> That's going to be fun, I'm sure. Yeah, I started in bees as a business in 1982 with 250 nucleuses I bought from a uh, bee supply house up in Minnesota. I had started in bees proper back in high school in the mid seventies. And by the time I graduated high school, I had 50 hives, which I told you a little bit earlier, uh, sold when I thought I'd go into the military. Then I had a health issue come up and kept me from being able to enlist. And I was sorely disappointed and uh, ended up going down the road of purchasing those extra beehives. And I thought I'd be a sideline beekeeper then and keep myself occupied. And a commercial beekeeper in my area in Wisconsin got wind of that and approached me about coming to Florida with him. That was the winter of uh, 81 and um, working with him. And I, I took the opportunity and I apprenticed under him for five years, worked all together about seven with him as my business grew from its original 250 hives to about 800 that I was running. And when you're running 800 hives, it's very hard to work for somebody else anymore. And my needs were conflicting with his need for my help. So uh, we ended up parting ways. And at the same time, I met my wife, Becky, about 87 we were married 1987 September. I met her in 85. And um, today, Becky and I have seven children. We run 4,500 hives of bees. We raise about 12,000 queens every winter here in Florida that we sell to beekeepers all over the United States, as well as tens of thousands of queen cells. And really, it was our growth and the fact that we sort of outgrew the ability for queen producers in our area to keep up with us. They had already obligations to other operations, some of which were a lot larger than ours. And so the, we, we just had a need to uh, learn to do it ourselves. I had the uh, opportunity to have some Serbian beekeepers that worked for another beekeeper here in Florida, then came to work for us, taught us some of their skills and made us, I think, the successful queen operation we are today. So a lot of thanks to the Stavanovic Skavoza and his son Kiki, um, as well as Gary from Honeyland Farms, who was my mentor. And I think of David Mixa uh, and his wife, Linda, learned a lot from them. Uh, so I, I was fortunate to end up in this part of Florida where there were good mentoring opportunities. Uh, Larry Bergman, beekeeper from Wisconsin, helped Becky and I out when the mites were at their peak and uh, we needed to come to Florida. And um, I hadn't worked for Gary for several years. So um, it, networking has also always been a big part of our success, in my opinion. It's one of the reasons why I said yes to this opportunity. Um, I'm excited for somebody your age that's doing something like this. Um, obviously it's technology that, uh, beyond my skill set, but I think it's great that you're reaching out to a large community all over the country. Really anybody can, can tune into you and hear some opinions and, uh, get some ideas, especially in the off season like this. So, oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, I appreciate you joining us tonight mm-hmm. and, you know, I really like to listen to a lot of different beekeepers, you know, um, 
no matter where they're from, whether they be in Canada or down there in Florida or even up north in, you know, northern United States, it's really great to hear other people's opinions mm -hmm. and their thoughts on certain techniques and what they like to do, you know, to keep their bees alive and keep their bees going and what they do in their operations. And I have fun doing it, and I really am glad that you're on here tonight. And first, you know, um, quick topic, and I we, we already talked about this in the back room, but I think some people would like to know. It's kind of how your flow is going, you know, kind of what are your bees kind of going after right now? Well, we don't have a flow, so to speak, in this part of Florida. We are in central Florida. We are in a latitude that's parallel with uh, Tampa and Orlando. Um, we do get a, a very nice pollen flow from maple at around the winter solstice, just before and through Christmas time. And then our willow blooms. And we've got five different types of willow that bloom here. Um, on a year like this, we do see a little bit of nectar. We haven't had a freeze. We haven't had a, even a heavy frost and lots of moisture. Uh, it's not raining every day now, which is great, but we had a lot of, of moisture ahead of time. And so we're seeing a little bit of flow of nectar from the willow. We had a lot of pollen from the maple. We're seeing some uh, pollen and nectar coming in right now from things like cherry laurel that are blooming nicely and wild cherry trees. Um, we will begin to start to see some Duhon holly in a few weeks and then gallberry and maybe some palmetto before we leave. We leave the state in May and head back to Wisconsin. And usually our palmetto is a May, June bloom here. So yeah. nothing really outstanding occurring right now but that and a few other wild weeds blooming are bringing in enough nectar to keep the bees a little bit a little bit happy they're not they're not too snoopy right now oh, i get you definitely you know sometimes you know when sometimes that definitely can be the case and you know right now we have a i guess you would say somewhat of a flow you know we our bees are bringing in pollen so i do know that i've been kind of admiring the bees you know, mm -hmm. kind of standing at the entrance. I just really like to do that on my hives or, you know, my hives and look and see kind of what we're doing. And, you know, I enjoy doing that too. And I do got a couple other topics. And also I will mention here for people who want to go on and um, uh, ask a question, if you would like to feel free to. And another topic I would like to talk about real quick. And, you know, we talked about it, you know, in the past, you know, and, and when we're talking kind of behind the scenes type thing is right now, of course, you know, um, what are you doing for, you know, mite treatments? Kind of what do you like to do for mite treatments? And, you know, if you could, you know, briefly explain to us kind of what your opinion is and kind of what you like to do, you know, when you're trying to treat for mites. Well, glad we got 45 minutes. huh? <laughs> we uh, we leave Wisconsin in October and head to was head to Florida takes about seven semis to get all the bees down. And it's about a semi a week. There's uh, roughly 600 to 700 hives on a semi. So during that spell, when the bees are arriving, we're able to uh, begin a, a, a regime of checking from uh, weight, make sure they have enough uh, feed in them because we do try to make sure they get a little fall flow before we bring them out of Wisconsin. We do give them at least two gallons of syrup up there. It's unmedicated. It's just plain syrup. Um, that gets them down here as singles. And uh, once they arrive in Florida, we're able to give them more if they need it. And we don't really anticipate they'll start building until after Christmas. So we have a period of time of about two and a half months that we can treat for mites where all we're doing is checking for feed otherwise not making any splits yet. There's no honey flows occurring. And I like to start once we hit uh, Florida with an essential oil and tactic treatment. And uh, the essential oil I generally will use at this point in time is um, tea tree oil, but we'll also use um, eucalyptus and camphor. Those are two very good oils for different reasons that seem, seem to show a lot of promise giving the, uh, the mites a lot of havoc. They uh, they disrupt the the mites' ability to function in the hive. They're not none of them are killers. The tactic is amitraz is a is a miticide that does work very effectively. 
but we like to buffer it with a um, essential oil. We'll give two treatments of that. And generally that's November, December. And then in January, early January, we will give them two more treatments of formic acid. And we cut our formic acid down to about 60%, 58, 60%. And uh, both of the essential oil treatments as well as the formic acid treatments are spaced about nine to 11 days apart. And we think it's critical to get it, those treatments on um, back to back that way so that uh, you're refreshing it up and keeping a pretty strong dose in front of those mites as they uh, begin to hatch along with the early brood that's there. And hopefully uh, we're killing some of the breeding females before they have a chance to go down and uh, start building up. Then we begin to make our mating nukes in February which we have finished doing. We're actually into our second week of caging queens. We don't like to use any mite treatments during the queen rearing season at all, except in perhaps support hives uh, or pollinating hives that don't have anything to do with the queens. Um, they will be given another round prior to leaving the state after the queen rearing is done of tactic end essential oil. And once they get to Wisconsin, then prior to putting the honey supers on, we will put a oxalic acid and glycerin pad on. It's a 50-50 blend by weight of uh, oxalic acid and glycerin. We try to get 50 grams per colony uh, is worth in, and we will then put an excluder over it because it's a single, and then we super it up, and that treatment will stay on all summer long. Hopefully, we have already gotten the mite level down or kept it down to a low, low, low level, well below a dangerous threshold. And then the oxalic acid presence will keep it that way all summer while they brood back up again to make us a good honey crop. And this has been successful now for two years, this regime. Bees look great. They return looking great. Um, we think in our operation with our stock here where we are uh, in this part of the state, uh, it was working well. I, I can't say that that's what everybody ought to do. I don't, everybody's a different, different, different locations, different, different bees. Uh, but that's what we do to answer your question. And uh, we plan on continuing to do that. And I didn't mention the thymol, but we do have thymol on hand. And if we ever were to find a, an outbreak when we're making nukes or going through the colonies, inspecting drones and looking for queen mothers or whatever we might be doing, that looks like it's got a brood issue a viral attack on the brood, then we would use a thymol treatment because we feel that was very effective um, therapeutic for sick brood. But this winter, we didn't see any at all. Yeah. We were, I would say out of all the colonies, we were running a little over 3,000 that came into the winter with us. Um, if we saw 10 that had a European foul broody appearance, and those generally were coming out of blueberries, that's, that's it. So they stayed healthy this winter. We're real happy about that. That's good. Nice to hear. Um, we do have a question here um, from Richard B. Bryan Jr. He, and he asks, how are the plas plastic hives holding up in the Florida sun? Tasting plastic in your honey yet? We don't use plastic hives. Um, we have used the um, frames that Pierco produces and acorn for about 30 years. And uh, no, we do not taste any plastic in our honey and neither do the bakeries we sell our honey to or the brewers we sell our honey to that use it in their sodas or the plethora of honey packers that buy our honey and put it on the table. And so no, I don't know if he was being smart or what with that question, but uh, you won't taste plastic in your honey from the plastic excluders or the plastic foundation or the plastic hives. I'm not a fan of plastic hives, but I am a uh, supporter of the plastic foundation. It's great if you have a small hive beetle issue, you can clean the frame easier. Fortunately, we don't, we're, we're blessed that we get out of here before they get bad. Uh, but like anybody that keeps any number of bees, if a colony uh, turns up dead and we don't catch it quick enough, the, the uh, wax moths can get in there. With plastic foundation, it's relatively easy to clean that up and re-wax it and reuse it if you're using a Duragilt 
or if you're using solid pure wax, which I have no problem with. Matter of fact, I used to have a mill. We milled our own 4.9 millimeter foundation. We sheeted the wax ourselves and milled it. It was a lot of work. We didn't see any great advantage to it, except it was a lot of extra work. Uh, but uh, the plastic gives you the ability to clean it up very quickly. Mice don't damage it. So uh, yeah, I, I think there's not any problem with the uh, plastic foundation whatsoever. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and we do got a question, another question here from Beekeeping, Beekeeping Burn. He asked, hey, Chris, what queen, queen rearing method would you recommend for backyard beekeeper? Um, I know when Bob, who introduced me to this whole scene, <laughs> came down and did his interviews, They his, inter, his um, YouTube videos show our type of queen rearing. We use a queen right starter finisher. I like it a great deal. It's one that I'm comfortable teaching anybody to use. It's great for a backyard beekeeper because he doesn't have to or she doesn't have to um, buy a lot of extra equipment just to double screen. And um, you can very quickly get your cells raised in a system like that. And when you're finished, it's still a good two-story unit that can be split immediately if you want to. Um, we like to use Jay-Z's BZ cell cups. All of their products we think are great. I like that cell cup particularly because we're able to inspect the cells uh, and we're able to cull cells that normally would go uncalled in an operation that was using strictly wax. They wouldn't see a problem that we are sometimes able to see through the glass cell cup, i.e. a small pupa or no pupa whatsoever, or sometimes even a pupa that's uh, pupated upside down. That, that occurs every once in a great while, and we can sometimes catch that. So uh, Jay-Z's Beezy's for the grafting uh, and the cells, and um, we really uh, like the two the uh, the uh, starter finisher with the double screen. That would be my advice. Yeah, I've heard a lot about that method, and I've um, seen those, you know, on YouTube too. You know, a lot of different types like that. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And it's definitely a very, very good method. And I like Star Slash Finisher. And one day I'm going to try to get a double screen board. Um, very easy to make. Mm -hmm. And um, try to use those out and see how that method works out. And I do got another little topic here too. And we talked about mm -hmm. this behind the scenes as well. And I was wondering if you could share, if, you know, the people who are watching kind of what your thoughts are. And what you kind of like to do, kind of your opinion on feeding, kind of how you feed, when you like to feed, you know, and a little bit about that if you could. Well, we we mentioned that here in Florida, the cattle ranchers have a saying, don't starve the profit out of your herd. And they'll feed a lot of round bales through the winter. And um, we feel it's the same way with your bees. If you are trying to do anything on the order that we are raising nucleuses for either mating queens or raising nucleus to sell to other customers you need to feed your bees if you're not on natural honey flow or you need to feed your bees prior to a natural honey flow to get enough brood to make it worthwhile to make the nucleuses i like to make nucleuses strong when people purchase nucleuses from us they're going to get four frames of brood and a frame of feed uh, all of our mating nucleuses are made up with two frames of brood and a frame of feed. We like to keep them strong, and that means we feed them. If we can't feed them liquid, we'll feed them dry sugar in the nucleuses with a solid bottom. Um, I don't like to gang feed or yard feed. We uh, don't want to start a robbing problem or feed other beekeepers bees or, um, you know, cause them a robbing problem. So we use internal feeders in our cell builders and we use bucket feeders for all of our hives and um, those are uh, one gallon here in Florida and two gallon in Wisconsin. I like to use sucrose and high fructose corn syrup. Sucrose of course is either white or uh, white sugar cane or beet doesn't matter to the bees. Um, you can purchase the pro sweet from Man Lake already mixed. It's expensive but it's very, very effective at raising brood. Anytime you're feeding sucrose to bees, um, you're going to see a little more brood, most likely, than you will with straight fructose. But the fructose is good if you want to just put some weight on and have that extra frame of feed to go into the nuke. So they're both good feeds. 
I think the, the main thing that I would say to any beekeeper that is asking about it, my opinion would be uh, feed them up that they get good and heavy, um, but don't feed to the point there's no room for the queen to lay. So that just comes with experience, knowing when to stop. That's right. You know, I've had that problem before, too. You know, I've mentioned it before, too, and it does take time, of course. And there's times, you know, where I fed a lot and the, there was nowhere for the queen to lay because they're all they did, you know, they, you know, mm -hmm. you know backstopped it, you know, into cells and the queen didn't have nowhere to lay. And, you know, I've definitely experienced that before. And that's definitely something important to, you know, think about and kind of, um, of course, like, like you said, it does take experience and you know, time to, you know, figure, you know, when and when not, you know, to, you know, start and stop feeding, you know, or, you know, stop feeding. And, you know, that's definitely, you know, good. And I like to feed. And like you said, you know, you know, bees are livestock. And I truly believe that, too. Something that I've always mentioned to other beekeepers about and try to get that, you know, out there to, you know, other people. And, you know, I definitely agree with you on that, too. And, you know really nothing else to say, you know, and I feed, you know, one-to-one -one sugar syrup, and I've been feeding for a little bit right now, just build them up, right now I'm not really feeding anymore, just because my bee, because, you know, my one have, you know, I've been kind of building it up, building it up, and I'm planning on maybe doing a couple more, maybe like, you know, eight ounce jars or something, but after, but, you know, once we get really on the hit flow, you know, when we're, you know, when we're very, very strong, and right now we kind of are, we'll, you know, kind of hold back on feeding but you know we're still kind of you know feeding for a couple more weeks just to you know just in case if we get another cold snap and you know they'll have a little bit you know in there for you know for the bees and well remember we were talking behind the scenes as you yeah. say uh you need to know your pollen flows That's right when the winter solstice occurs which it occurs everywhere at the same time 22nd of december they start to get longer right. and from that point on into the spring, the bees will be more inclined to raise brood. Prior to that, they won't. So any feeding that goes on prior to that often just gets stored away. The bees aren't interested in raising a lot of brood. But um, that's one switch that gets turned on, the daylight lengthening. The other one is the natural pollen flow. And if we were to feed a lot of sucrose right now, it would all be converted into brood. And the proof of that is that when we get into colonies, we've been feeding or have fed, Right now, a single, it's not uncommon to see uh, nine and sometimes nine and a half frames of brood. We have a lot of weight, but a lot of it's brood and pollen, and they're converting everything we're feeding into brood. Well, that's too much brood. So um, you got to be careful and know what your bees are doing. Um, I can't speak to southern Alabama, but I can tell you that here in central Florida, that would be the case. So I would caution anyone here about feeding too heavily at this point in time because uh, if you've been feeding for any length of time, you might have a whole lot more brood in there than you realize. And um, some of that weight you think you've gained might actually be brood. So it's right. good to put your eyes on that brood nest uh, before you just feed any more. That's right. Definitely. You know, that's definitely something, you know, to think about. And, you know, um, definitely. And let's see here. I think I missed a question. Mm -hmm. Chris, can you share a central oil recipe with us? Well, I certainly can. If you're going to use an essential oil, my recommendation is to you start with a canola oil. Um, my only reason for choosing canola is because it's been shown in studies that canola all by itself, just canola itself, is a light miticide. So over regular vegetable, I would choose the canola oil. And... Um, you got to realize when we're mixing up our treatments, we're, we're, we're treating for a lot of hives. We're, we're going to go out and treat 300 hives any given day at least. So you'll want to ratio this down. But I would start with a gallon of canola oil, and then I would add 200 milliliters of any of the essential oils I wanted to add. I wouldn't add more than three. And I can tell you that the camphor, as well as the eucalyptus and the tea tree do not seem to conflict with each other. They seem to complement one another. You can get some advice from winter sun. And also we use um, 
Imran Liebermuth out of Indiana, and they'll give us some good ideas on things that oils that complement each other. If you're going to mix this as a buffer to either the formic acid or to tactic, um, we don't use it as a buffer with the oxalic, but with formic we would. Um, then I would only use one of those oils. Um, and tea tree would probably be my choice. If you wanted to buy just one, it would be the tea tree. Um, but camphor, like I said, in our experience is, is a good beneficial as well as using the eucalyptus. And those oils are available from those two companies I mentioned. Um, but uh, 200 milliliters to a gallon. And even if I'm only going to use one oil, one gallon of our one oil, it would still only be 200 milliliters of that oil to that gallon of, of, uh, of uh, canola oil. And then we like to soak blue shop towels, but you can also use absorbent meat pads that are available online, like Tidy Dry is a brand, and uh, they'll soak up the oil very well, and you can use those. And they're slow, relatively slow release, and the bees will tear them up. They're very biodegradable. You don't have to go back and remove them. So uh, that's been what we like to do. Definitely. And... If you got a quick little topic earlier, we were talking about um, double screen boards, you know, you know, for mm -hmm. queen rearing. Yes. So I was wondering if you could just, you know, kind of share with us some things that you like to use, you know, um, double screen boards with. And what are some things that you can, you know, that are available for other beekeepers to use, you know, with double screen boards as well? Well, you could use the double screen board as a moving cover if you wanted to because you can uh, stack brood boxes up on top one another if you wanted to do that. Uh, with a good double screen, you're gonna have one of the sides is gonna have an opening in it, a little small opening, say a half an inch to a, a, a full inch wide. Um, I like to use a uh, five ace rim on the top and the bottom with about a three quarter inch divider between the screens, half to three quarters and I use eight mesh. So when we're putting it in use as a cell building um, aid in our cell builder colonies, the opening will be up and the queen will be on that side of the double screen so that her bees that are in that box with her can get out that back entrance. They'll return to the front entrance where the where the cells are in the cell builder there is no entrance at the top from the uh, double screen uh, for the for the bees that are in the lower unit that's a solid um, rim all the way around with no entrance so if you can imagine it you've got a five eighths inch rim all the way around both top and bottom but the top has about a half inch to a full inch opening to the back of the board and um like I said, if you wanted to use it for other things, it would be good for a, a moving board in the summertime to give a little bit more ventilation if you're making full splits and moving them. Um, you could put one on the top and one on the bottom. Uh, otherwise, I, I don't see a practical use for it in a, in a beehive. Um, it wouldn't necessarily work very well if you were trying to use it as a um a divider for a two queen colony, they were just, just a regular queen excluder would be what you'd go with there. So it's in, it's really kind of one dimensional. It's used for the, you it used for a cell builder. Maybe somebody clever out there has got another use for it. I, we don't, uh, but it could be used as, like I said, it's a uh, aid in moving during real hot weather to give a little more ventilation. Definitely some good uses. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, can error, um, I hope I'm saying your name right, it says, what kind or size queen mating boxes do you use? What we do is uh, we take all of the brood chambers. We use regular 9-inch 10-frame boxes. And as we assemble them, we assemble several hundred every year, um, we put two grooves inside of the box on the um, front and the two fronts of the box, two narrow sections, so that the box is divided into three units, each unit holding three frames. And we can slide a um, P 
piece of Luon board or a piece of Masonite down in there. Masonite's nice because the one eighth Masonite is quite sturdy. And it won't break down very easily. Luon is a little more flexible, a little less expensive, but breaks down a little bit easier. But that'll make a three frame division. And so all of our mating nucleuses are three deep frames. And we give our bees 24 days from the time the cells put in to the time we cage the queen. So there's always cat brood there when we cage our queen. That gives us a tested queen. If we choose to leave her in there another four or five days, we would have a proven queen because we'd have um, uh, bees emerging. We'd actually be able to see what her bees look like. Um, we will also then generate our five frame nukes that we sell to people in the spring from those nukes, those mating nucleuses. We can get two of them out of one box. There's nine frames available to us so we can make two five frame nukes, just adding one extra comb to, to one of them. So uh, it's, it's the maximum utilization of our available resources, I like to say. We uh, can reuse that box again the next season. We can utilize that same box by just pulling the dividers and adding a tenth comb, taking it off the bottom board and putting it on a clip type pallet. And all of our bees for honey production and moving when we migrate are on uh, four-way clip type screen bottom pallets and I like to use either eight or six mesh on those screens and I should say that the uh, double screen is also either eight or six mesh. I get you. Um, beekeeping bro asked another question. He has Chris what is your what is your opinion or you know um, to select the breeder breeder yeah. brand, I think about yeah, well, as far as the breather queen goes, yes, it's important she's breathing. We gotta find first thing is find a good live one. Um, I like to find a queen that is marked from last season. I like her to be a have been, have been a good queen or a good honey producer from a good a colony to produce a good crop of honey. Uh, Caleb, Nate, Glenn, Tommy, the boys that do all of our honey pulling, uh, are careful to mark colonies for us over the summer that, that appeared to do exceptionally well. That's one criteria. Another is gentleness. Um, to some degree, but it isn't critical, color. We do like to have a gray or a darker bee versus a real golden Italian bee. Um, good pollen production. And, of course, survivors. Um, I have mentioned a multiple number of mite controls that we do use. But uh, for many years, we used only essential oil. And we would sustain 40 to sometimes 50% loss each winter. And during those years, we were grafting from our survivors. We still do that, obviously. Anything that's made it here to Florida, uh, our survivors. They didn't perish in the fall. They weren't culled once they got down here. Um, so by doing that, we have not brought any other stock into our operation since we brought it in in 2000. And maybe 2001, I think 2000, 2001, we, we might have bought um, from both CF Conan as well as Strachan out in California, some of their Carniolan stock, about 100 queens. And from each of those hundreds, so 400 in total, two from each, over two years, we selected each year very good quality queen mothers for us to graft from. So we wouldn't use one immediately. We waited until it went through a whole season, made it back to Florida, still bearing its mark so we knew it wasn't a swarm queen, and then that would be a, a queen mother for us. And um, what we have now is nationally known to be very gentle, extremely productive all over the place. They're not Florida queens or Wisconsin queens. They're, they're queens that can function in almost any state of the union and produce honey and uh, not sting the daylights out of you and uh, and hold up pretty well against mice. I, I, I often used to say our bees will die as well as anybody else's under a heavy mite load, and that's, that's the truth. But they also survive pretty well if you treat them right. I get you. Um, DC's Bees, he asks, curious on the color. What is your reasoning for preferring the darker bee? I like dark bees, but curious. Um. Part of that goes back to the opinion that the Serbians had that the Carniolan was a superior bee to the uh, Italian. 
Some of the Italian traits are very large brood nests. Anybody that raises a lot of Italians knows that. There are some excellent package producers in Georgia and queen producers, and they raise primarily Italians. And um, they need to because they need a lot of bees because they're raising package bees. Um, pollinators like them because they're big clusters. Um, I do not care for them because they do eat quite a little bit and they produce a lot more brood than we generally need. It is an opinion that the Carniolans seem to hold up a little bit better under a mite load than the, the Italians. It's probably just the numbers. They don't raise as much brood. They don't raise as many mites. So they, they are not uh, carrying as heavy a mite load. Um, they're extremely hard to find our queens, our camouflage queens. So we do it at our own expense because it can take a lot longer to find a, a gray or banded queen in a colony of gray banded bees than it would be to find a big, fat, golden Italian queen. She, she stands out even with all of her golden banded bees. So um, there's pros and cons. But uh, overall, we like the little bit smaller cluster um, it's more controllable. They make great crops of honey. They always brood up when they need to ahead of time, make a, make that honey, and then they, they tend to uh, bring their cluster back into a reasonable size and and uh, winter really, really quite well. Yeah, I get you. Definitely. And I got another small topic. More questions will be coming in. And we talked a little bit about this, you know, behind the scenes, you know, when we're just kind of chatting a little bit. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could kind of share with us um, some techniques and some some of your preferred methods for splitting when you you know when you start to split. Sure, um, I know in, in opportunities I've had to speak to larger groups, I've got some powerpoints and I've got some uh, um, photographs of what our our units look like. And and again, if you look up Bob Benny's um, videos, you'll you'll see what it looked like. They did some great filming. Um, I like, if I'm going to go to the work of making a split and I, and I, I encourage other beekeepers to do this too, that I mentor a little bit. Why not set up that three nuke box and split into it? Because you're still going to end up with um, a full box split, but now you're going to have three opportunities at a queen you have to get three queen cells, of course, or raise them. But you got three shots at a queen instead of just one for each unit you do that to. You can maybe provide some extra queens to other beekeeper friends of yours, or you could make um, a couple of splits and sell one of the queens, um, or any number of, of different ideas that might come into your mind once you successfully have three queens there versus just the one. Um, so I would recommend doing that. Consider it at least. Um, otherwise, if you're just interested in making up splits, I would like to, if it was me giving the recommendation, I would like to go ahead and split into a small unit, like a five frame nuke box and, uh, move that away. Then let the queen build back into the five empty combs you give her to replace the five you moved. And, um, then the nucleus can be installed at some point into a, another box with, uh, more combs, either foundation or drawn comb, and let it build um, slowly. It's going to build a little bit slower because you don't have the field force. You've moved it away. Uh, that's one reason for leaving it in the five frame nuke for just a little while, because you need to let that brood hatch to get the numbers up. They'll protect the comb that you give them better. Um, small high beetles are not a problem for us here in this part of Florida. They're present, but they never cause us any grief. We're out of here before it gets real hot and humid. But if you're living where you live uh, or anywhere in the southern part of the United States in the summertime, if you make a split, you will have to contend with small high beetles, which can descend upon a colony and, and overwhelm it. And then once they get a foothold and start laying eggs and you get, start to get a larva, you've already lost the game. So um, smaller domicile, easier for them to defend. Um, I don't know that eight frame equipment uh, is easier for the bees to defend, but it's, it's in theory, it's a good idea. There might be listeners out there right now who say, oh, no, Chris, I run eight frame and small high beetles tear me up, too. That could well be. But I, I have seen and experienced going over and looking at other beekeepers and trying to help them out. 
they've got much too small a split into a very large box and um, there might even be wax moth started in some cases on one end the bees can't defend against that so uh, that's why I, I say either the three three frame nukes in one big deep box and make a full deep box split or if you don't have enough bees to do that just go ahead and make it into a five frame nuke box that would be my advice definitely uh ron alley here and he says hey chris how do you feel about using peppermint candy to control hot beetles well ron i don't believe that it will do you any good i don't think the peppermint will chase the hive beetles away um i never tried it um, i've never even tried peppermint as a essential oil i know that the menthol didn't seem to have much effect against the uh, small hive beetles it was very effective of course against um, trachea mites and perhaps peppermint candy if you feed it is perhaps effective against trachea mites which are still out there so if you have it available to you, if you're in Georgia, I know the Brock's Candy Company, uh, it was a, a lot of beekeepers used to get the, the candy and they would feed it that way. And um, so, I, but I just, I don't, I don't have any experience that it would necessarily repel them. Interestingly, we do put cinnamon in our pollen cakes when we make our, our uh, pollen cakes. And um, the cinnamon is a great deterrent to ants. So we put it in there to keep ants away, we think that it has some effect against feral mites. Can't prove that, but we think it's possible that it does. And it appears to be a slight deterrent against the small hive beetle because our cakes rarely have any buildup of any amount of the small hive beetle larva. Occasionally a little bit, tiny bit with little small worms, but um, we also make our, our pollen cakes up, our protein cakes, I should say, uh, very high and heavy on the carbohydrate end. Um, so the bees consume them very quickly and they stay real soft. So they're consumed very quickly and the cinnamon as an addition, I think, helps to control that for us. Definitely. And um, I do got another topic, you know, to talk about. And I've mm -hmm. talked uh, this topic mm -hmm. on a lot of my chats. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've probably used some different techniques and I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about what are some of different hive configurations you like so what I mean by hive configurations is like do you prefer double deeps over single deeps or do you prefer singles over doubles and you know just kind of your opinion on that okay that's a good question um I'll tell you what we prefer and I'll tell you why we do we prefer singles and we do it because we can get a lot more hives on the ground with a lot less equipment than running a double, just a single. We find that if all of that comb in that single, 80 to 90 percent of it at least, more than that, probably 90 to 100 percent of it is worker cell and not drone, she'll have no problem completing a full cycle and not running out of space so she has all the room she needs to raise all the brood she can. And over that excluder that goes on top of that single will be always open honey supers, space. So they'll put the nectar and the honey they collect up there. They'll have some honey in that bottom box, not very much. Sometimes only a little bit on the outside frames. So that it's important to make sure that you're keeping that in mind when you strip the honey that you get a bucket of feed on them right away or the second dark brood chamber, which we put on in the late summer, early fall in Wisconsin. Um, and then we let them fill that up with whatever honey they make off of goldenrod and aster and late sweet clover. So some of our hives do come down to Florida as doubles, but that's just to get dark equipment back down to split into the, the following season. But all of our honey production is done primarily almost exclusively in singles. And that's to maximize the amount of honey that the bees will produce for us. And then we will give them back a carbohydrate in the form of either high fructose corn syrup or sucrose or a blend like ProSweet after we've pulled the honey crop. And in some cases, some of the early hives, we'll give them a second brood chamber and uh, let them store away honey in that uh, goldenrod, aster, goldenrod, uh, sweet clover blend like that in Wisconsin. 
definitely. Beekeeping Gardening has a question. He, is, he says, Chris, I have a question for you about what is your opinion on breeding virgin one to three days and how do you prefer to put it in colonies? Well, we don't do that. I, I know that there are a number of people who do. Uh, there's a number of people that are very successful at raising virgins and even selling them. I know that in Europe, Germany in particular, um, they're sold on the market and, and uh, we don't have any experience raising and selling virgins. We do obviously start out with virgins in everything, but we're not disturbing them until after they're mated and have settled in and have a, uh, a good amount of brood and cat brood present. Then we cage them as a mature, um, fully developed queen. Um, that's, that's what I do. That's what we do. So I can't really speak to his question. Um, I have no experience doing it. I get you. Try to ask Chris, Sue Colby intended to bring more diversity to carny lines of bees. Did it backfire every carny is not related to her stock? <laughs> no, every carny is not related to her stock. Um, and no, it didn't backfire, but it wasn't necessary. Um, I'm not kicking her work at all. I mean, whatever she did, I'm sure contributed some good. Um, but it isn't necessary. Uh, the bees that we have here in the United States are over 400 years old, in some cases 500 years old, could be argued. Going back to the Spanish, who were the first to bring them when they came here and started their missions all along the East Coast and California coast also. Then every other European people group that came brought bees with them. Just have to check the chip, ship manifest to prove that. So the new world, as we call the United States of America today, um, it while it didn't, we don't believe, have anything that looked like a honeybee when the first European settlers came, it did have a lot of native bees that were doing a great job pollinating the things that were here, but they weren't honeybees. So honeybees were brought to make wax for candles. That's why the Spanish brought them, the missions. But also it provided a source of honey. The Native Americans called them white man's flies. They didn't care much for them, but they sure loved the honey. So they've taken off. They've spread across the country. They're great diversity. Lots and lots of different genes in there. Yes, we've had a lot of, of years of collapse. We've had decades of uh, problems with pesticides. Thankfully, that hopefully is behind us. But uh, what survived are bees that are very good at making tremendous crops and doing a great job all over the United States. Uh, again, I, I just don't want to disrespect anybody that has a different opinion, but I'm just going to say to you that our bees produce in excess of 100 pound average in Wisconsin every year. Every year. We produce well in excess of 10,000 queens on the way to 13,000 queens every year in Florida, Lord willing. We have good weather, we can do it. And we sell a lot of nucleuses. So our stock can survive the mites. Yes, we'll have losses. Um, but in general, we always come out on the other end with, with good survivability. Uh, the ones that do come through are, are better off for it. And um, we're only one of hundreds of different operations like ours, some bigger, some smaller. So the genetic diversity in the United States is outstanding. It's profound. Uh, do not believe, I do not believe for a second we need to bring any more in from anywhere else. Will it hurt if it does? No, I don't think so. Uh, but I don't think it's necessary. I'd be concerned about bringing in one of the other foreign mites that we're worried about or some other disease we're not aware of yet. So I'm, I'm not in favor of bringing anything more in, but I don't think it's necessary. I get you. Um, let's see here. Beekeeping Bro, he says, Hey, Chris, did you use whey for protein supplement and pollen patties or liquid feed? We do not use whey. We do mix our own protein patties, but I'll either use um, the Mega Bee or the Ultra Bee that uh, Man Lake sells or the AP23 that uh, they dance sells. I like to buy it bulk, either in the big 2,000 pound sacks or uh, buy the 50 pound bag. And we mix it with sucrose in the form of sugar. 
I generally will use 20 pounds of the protein to 40 pounds or 30 pounds of the, depending on the mixer bowl I'm using, of the sugar, and then enough um, high fructose corn syrup to uh, make it a nice sticky patty. We'll add things like um, a propolis that we freeze and grind into a fine dust. We add that back about two pounds to a batch, an 80 pound batch. We'll add cinnamon, about nine ounces or half of an 18 ounce container to an 80 pound batch. Um, then uh, sometimes citric acid. We don't generally always need to do that, but uh, there was a time when we were, we were afraid our acid levels were too low in the hives. So we added a little bit to bring the acid level up. Um, we generally don't add any antibiotic other than the um, propolis to it. So we, we find that the, their protein mix, they've really researched it. The bees like it, does a great job, but we do feed it a little bit high on the carbohydrate level side, much higher than they would normally, so that the bees eat it quickly. Carbohydrate never goes to waste, and I don't want them to waste any of the expensive protein. It's not cheap, and it's easy to go back and give it to them again. We usually feed a one-pound cake. If it's a very small hive or a nucleus, we'll give them a half of that, half a pound at a time. I get you. Um, Ron Alley, and he says, how about have a lot of patties for feeding bees? I, like I said, I, I, I don't purchase anybody else's patties. Um, not, nothing against them. We just can mix them ourselves. We keep it fresh that way. We'll mix what we need as we need it. Um, one man can easily mix in a two or three hour period, three, four hundred patties. And we don't need any more than that at a time. Um, but we'll mix maybe four or five days worth at a time, keep them in five gallon buckets and take them out. So I'm sure that whatever Hive Alive has put together is great. They might even have some probiotics in theirs or some other nutrient that we uh, we don't have. My wife feeds me probiotics all the time. She's always giving me enzymes and they never affect, <laughs> they never help me. If, if I need a boost, I'll take a five hour energy drink. That works, but uh, I'm not about to go putting that into my bee feed, but uh all of those other things, I, I, they don't work on me, so I'm not a big fan of spending the money and putting it in there for the bees. I could be wrong. I know Bob Benny thinks that they're great, and a number of other people I respect a great deal thinks they see great benefit from it. I can tell you this. After trying both Daydance products and, and Man Lakes, um, we fed our entire operation, one half of the truck, when we unload our trucks, there's 160 hives in a location, so 80 in each spot. And we fed half the side, one half the truck, one half of the yard. Patties, the other half of the truck, we did not feed patties. And we did that the entire winter. And at the end of the nuke making season, when we were all done, we'd made seven groups. Not one single group did we make more nukes on the side that we fed patties to than we did on the side that we didn't feed patties to. We felt great about giving patties to those hives, especially if they were poor looking. We felt like they were we were doing them a great service, just like my wife Becky feels like she's doing me a great service when she gives me probiotics. But I don't really feel any better, and I don't seem to get any more work done when I'm on them, so I don't think it did much for the bees either. So that's just Chris Werner's opinion. I still feed them in, my, in our cell builders, and we still will make some up to give to colonies that look like they've got a problem, look sick. Uh, we will still do that because of Becky, still my wife, so we'll do that. But to, otherwise, I, I I don't personally see there's a, a need to do it. And I would say this. If you're maintaining an eye on your brood nest and you can see that your bees are actively bringing in pollen and they've got a whole sheet of pollen that's built next to the brood nest, you don't need to feed any pollen to your bees. And if you're trying to feed it to them in November, December, again, it's at a time of the year when the bees' internal clock is telling them not to raise brood. The days are getting shorter everywhere, all over the place, east coast, west coast. They don't start to get longer until the 22nd of December. So feeding it prior to that, I, again, I don't think it does you a whole lot of good. That's just my opinion. I get you. Um, the Morris Homestead, and this is a good question, and I'll, I want, I'm okay. interested in I'm too. ready for it. And he says, 
I would like to know what are the signs he looks for to start grafting drones and colony or something else. Yes. With drones is most important. You have to have plenty of good drones. Um, in some cases in with our bees, they come to Florida with drones. And if we don't have a freeze, they generally never lose all of their drones. They tend to maintain them um, through the winter, some of them at least. But uh, when the colony begins to really actively produce new drones, um, that in our case is usually sometime in January after Christmas again, then we can start thinking about the graft. The other thing we look for is a natural pollen flow so that they're going to be in a position to uh, be moving in the direction of building towards a swarming environment. Honeybees do one of two things, and some do both. They hoard or they swarm. If they hoard, they'll usually stay home and make the beekeeper a nice crop of honey and everybody's happy. Other bees will not make a crop of honey. They will swarm, and that makes them happy. Beekeeper's unhappy. So a colony that's a good cell builder is generally one that tends to want to be on that swarming side. So that's something we're looking for too. We're not only looking for drones, but we're watching our colonies. Now, we don't have to watch anymore. We've been doing this long enough that we know that here in this part of Florida, we can consistently start grafting the last week in January. No question about it. We will have enough drones. There will be pollen sufficient coming in. The weather will be good enough. We will be out of any fall rainy cycle and into a winter generally dry cycle. So um, we are at a point now where we kind of know we just can. But if you're just starting out, look for drones. Find out when and what is blooming in your area and make sure that your bees are accessing it, that it's in your area, not just out of reach, but where your bees can reach it. And um, watch your weather patterns too. If you live where you do, Grayson, uh, you were explaining to me, you came through a pretty wet spell. It wouldn't sure. have been a very profitable time for you to be raising queens. That's another reason we settled here. This is where a lot of queen breeders were in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and there's still several of us still here. Um, it's because of the weather pattern in this unique area. We are relatively dry all winter, and we can consistently mate well our virgins. Yeah, I get you. DC's B says, Chris, do you find any line of B more swarmy than others? Yes. I'll tell you, DC, it's a little story. One year we thought we would be wise and we grafted from one of our best cell builders, the very last graft or two, maybe it was a couple of grafts. And um, we put those cells out and I think we probably ended up with something like 14, 1500 hives that were queen mothered by that cell builder. Well, we got to Wisconsin and what do you think those bees did when they got up there on that bodacious honey flow that starts in May and doesn't end until July? They swarmed. They built swarm cells and swarmed. That's what they did. And we didn't make very much honey from them. So we didn't do that again. It's nice to have good, strong cell builders, and we do look for that trait for our cell builders. But uh, as a general trait in all of our colonies, that's not a trait we want to see. So um, that's one we don't select for anymore, not for the general population. Uh, we have one more question here, then I do have one more topic, then we'll end it off. Okay. He says, DC says, um, I guess this kind of goes back to the question you're, you're, you know when we're just talking about. It. it says, "Do you think any or any or many of those genetics have survived from the '70s?" I don't know, DC. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not a geneticist. I'm not any kind of a scientist at all. I'm an observationalist. I observe things and and, and make decisions from what I see. I would say yes, but I'm only saying that because of the color of our bees. I know that uh, Strachan bees and Conan's, and they're both still in business, I believe, are very gray, and um, they're a very, very gentle bee in most cases. Our bees are very gentle, and some of them are quite gray. Uh, but we, we over the years, have uh, 
probably gotten back a little bit more Italian because that's a predominant uh, race of bee in this area. So um, probably not a lot, but enough that our bees are uh, functioning and performing as well as we could like to see them. I suppose if I ever developed a real problem with something, some issue, and thought it could be addressed by going with another um, round of something like the Conan or, or Strachan stock, I would do that. I know um, we've, we're talking with a number of uh, young beekeepers that we've met at uh, some of Cayman's events that um, have some exciting ideas about accelerating our uh, mite resistant um, traits in our bees. And uh, we may use some of that stock um, in the next several years and see if we can accelerate that a little bit. Um, I do not practice artificial insemination. Again, I have no experience with it. I'm not, I'm not against it. It's just not something that we do. Pretty much everything we do is occurs naturally, open mating. Definitely. I do have one more topic. Mm -hmm. And this one is, I was wondering if you could mm -hmm. just give a couple, maybe one or two tips to beginner beekeepers, you know, just a couple of things that might help them out, you know, when they're going to try to get into beekeeping. I would highly recommend that you buy a copy of the American Bee Journal. I think it's a great journal. Um, I'm not even sure if Gleanings is still being published. If it is, that's also or always had been a great publication. I'd encourage you to join a bee club. I'd encourage you to, if you can't afford to, go to uh, an event like Cayman puts on. Uh, the uh, Honey Bee Expo that he put on in Kentucky was well attended, and you'll meet tremendous people there. You'll hear, in many cases, great speakers, and you'll be able to network. And that's the other reason for joining the Bee Club is you'll network. You'll find other beekeepers you can work with, perhaps somebody you can actually even partner to some degree with and help you with the work. Maybe they'll have an extracting outfit. You don't have to spend the money on it for a few years. You can share your labor for their use of their extractor, something like that. Um, and then I would say, um, you know, take time to take good care of your bees. And that might mean you need a mentor looking over your shoulder to make sure you're not in them too often. But when you are in them, you're looking at what you need to look at and you're getting out quickly. The other thing is learn how to light a smoker efficiently. Find a good smoker fuel. I like pine needles um, because we're in our bees all day long. We put a little wood pellets in there with them. Keeps that smoker going all day long. One of the things I always told my boys as they were growing up was when I was moving bees, I wanted to see copious clouds of billowous white smoke. They had to memorize that. Copious clouds of billowous white smoke. That kept those bees in the hives when we were moving them. And when we were working them, same thing. Not necessarily billowous clouds, but white smoke. Not blue hot smoke, but white cool smoke. And don't be afraid to use it. Something the Serbians really drilled into us was um, when you go to a beehive, you knock on the door the same way you would at your neighbors if you wanted to visit them. And the smoke is the knocking on the hive. They do begin to recognize you. They will uh, acknowledge that it's the beekeeper and not a bear or a raccoon or a skunk. And you'll find your experience in the bees a lot more pleasant if you always use smoke, always use the same smoke, and always use it the same way. And sure. uh, if you get angry, if your bees are stinging you, close your hive and go away. Because if you're angry, that's as bad as being frightened. And sure. uh, they'll sense on that and trigger on it. So um, try to also approach your bees on nice days. Uh, when they're flying. Don't go into them before the field force is active and try to be done doing any work you're going to do before the field force is all returned. Those would be some pieces of advice I think I'd give Definitely. a beginner. Definitely. We do have one more question about lately came in and okay. he asked, um, um, Chris, do you have any VSH breeder queens? I do not, but I am working with a young man to get some that he's working with and we're going to work with him this spring. And uh, we, uh, we, we believe that the industry and certain performers in it have reached a point where they really are making some headway and it's, it's real, it's genuine, it's provable, it's observable for people like me. 
who aren't scientists. Uh, we have to see it in the bees. And, and uh, I was impressed with some of the speakers in Kentucky. They proved to me that they definitely know what they're doing. And we have actually had them come visit us. And we're excited about working with them this coming season. And uh, when we have it, we will advertise it as such. At this point, we, we have never tested for it. We don't know that we have it. All we can say is what I said earlier. Under a heavy mite load, my bees will die as well as anybody else's. But if you take good care of your bees, they will perform as well or better than anybody else's. Definitely. Well, go. I guess I'll go on and end this off here. We've been going for about an hour. I do appreciate you, Chris, joining us tonight and sparing your time and answering questions and answering a couple of my questions. Mm -hmm. And I also do appreciate my viewers watching too. And if you're watching, go on and click the thumbs up button on the way out. And thank Chris for joining us tonight because I really do appreciate it. And I learned a lot tonight. And I really like, you know, just listening to our beekeepers and, you know, being able to um, listen to their um, um, ideas and their preferences and some of their opinions on different things. You can definitely learn a lot. But I do appreciate you, um, Chris, joining us tonight. And I, um, I uh, appreciate you sparing your time to join us tonight. Well, thank you, Grace, and I appreciate you inviting me on, and I encourage you to keep up the good work, and I hope your bees do extremely well this summer for you, and look forward to hearing good things next season. Definitely. Same to you. So take care, everybody, and have a good night. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>